Hello, and welcome to part two of Texas State Restorative Justice Town Hall Series. My name is Dr. Stella Silva, and I'm the Assistant Vice President for Institutional Inclusive Excellence for Faculty and Staff Initiatives and Interim Chief Diversity Officer. On behalf of Institutional Inclusive Excellence, I want to welcome you back for those of you who are returning to participate in the second Town Hall, as well as everyone who is attending the Town Hall Series for the very first time. Today's format um, with the town hall will, will include introductory remarks, panel discussions, open discussions from you, the participants and panel, and we will have closing takeaways offered by our panelists, closing remarks and information on the third town hall. In order for us to maximize the amount of time we have for discussion, we are going immediately into the program with opening remarks from our provost Dr. B Dr. Jean Bourgeois after I provide an introduction. Dr. Jean Bourgeois has served as Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Texas State University since 2011. As the university's Chief Academic Officer, he is responsible for the administration and oversight of the quality of the university's academic, instructional, and research programs and for the coordination of the university's administrative and support functions central to its academic mission. Dr. Bourgeois earned a bachelor's and a master's degree in history from Louisiana State University and a PhD in history from the University of Cambridge. He joined Texas State University as an assistant professor of history in 1990 and was promoted to professor in 20, 2004. His publications include books and articles on 16th century English history. At this time, I would like to welcome Dr. our provost, Dr. Jean Bourgeois. Thank you very much, Dr. Silva. I appreciate the introduction. Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today for the second session in our three-part Restorative Justice Virtual Town Hall series storytelling, healing, and transformation. During our first town hall, our panelists covered a number of key issues related to the theme and focus of our town hall issues. Dr. Dwight Watson and Kate Cotman covered transgenerational racial trauma from historical and psychological perspectives, whereas Dr. Greg Moses provided insights into the legitimacy of resistance movements as historical community responses to transgenerational racial trauma. Dr. Scott Bowman offered a discussion of the social contract between a nation and its people as a way to enable us to better contextualize why restorative practices, as were shared by restorative justice educator and Texas State alumna, Veronica Silva, represent part of the necessary elements of healing when members of a community have experienced the painful impact of traumatizing racial injustice. It is important that we keep the conversation going with the understanding that our goal is to move from conversation to action. A part of the action we are taking as a university is to invite black faculty, staff, and students to share their experiences with us. While this may seem passive, I want to acknowledge that our asking is overdue, long overdue. And we are appreciative that our community members are still willing to participate in this dialogue with us. A quote that has often been stated in these past few months by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is an apt summary of a reasonable response when conversation is not engaged. A riot is the language of the unheard. I assure you, we are here, we want to listen, and we want to understand. Hosting these town halls is one demonstration of our commitment to that end. Additionally, I suggest this reflects our commitment to hold ourselves accountable to a standard of intentionally regarding the advancement and investment of ourselves as a community in racially just and inclusive practices. An American hero, John Lewis passed away a little more than two weeks ago. Representative Lewis basically spent his entire life fighting for racial justice and against police brutality and racist law enforcement while living clearly with transgenerational trauma. Among his final words to our nation, he said, to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. We know that we, as white people, still have much to learn. 
And oftentimes our learning as white people comes at the emotional expense of people of color. In this instance, at the expense of our panelists who have agreed to participate in this town hall and share what may be painful and triggering recollections of injustices so that we may learn from our mistakes and grow as members of the same community. Thank you panelists for your courage and willingness to share with us today. While our last town hall focused on specific context for this conversation, the second dialogue will focus on healing, transformation, and restorative action from the varying perspectives of our panelists, as well as from you, the participants, as you share your ideas, questions, and input about how we can together co-create the kind of community to further advance inclusive practices and proactive strategies that nurture a culture of community where all members of our community thrive and feel valued. Lastly, I want to thank Institutional Inclusive Excellence for all of their hard work in conceptualizing and coordinating our town hall series. Thank you all for joining us today and including yourself in this important community work of equity, inclusion, and justice. I will now turn the conversation over to our moderator, Dr. Dewana Goldstone, who couldn't get here to Central Texas fast enough, Associate Professor of History and Director of our American, African American Studies Initiative, Dr. Goldstone. Thank you. First, let me begin by thanking each of you for agreeing to join us in this conversation today. While these types of conversations are taking place across the nation, we need to pause to recognize the uncompensated efforts of people of color in addressing systematic racism and marginalization within organizations, a, a phenomena Lerma Hamilton Nielsen coined racialized equity labor. For your time, effort, and participation, we sincerely thank you. As we embark on this conversation, I invite those of you who are interested in learning more about the faculty and staff on our panel today to visit our website to view our, their profiles. Out of respect to our students and the recognized vulnerable position they are placing themselves in for us today, we will commence directly into our conversation rather than give individual introductions. As people of color, we know that acts of racism and the subsequent trauma that often follows can range from overt to covert. For example, according to statistics analyzed by mappingpoliceviolence.org, Police have killed more people so far this year, 598, than they did during the same period in past years. Of these, black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people, even though black people are 1.3 times more likely to be unarmed than white people. Recent research finds that black teens are 21 times more likely to be killed by police than white teens. Though their wrongdoings level, levels are comparable, Black boys are incarcerated at rates 20 to 24 times that of white boys in some states. Black and white Americans sell and use drugs at similar rates, but blacks are nearly three times as likely to be arrested and administered significantly longer sentences than their white counterparts for similar or the same crimes. Black and Latinx people make up over 60% of US prisoners while making up 35% of the adult population. Girls and women of color are the fastest growing segments of the incarcerated population. Black women who make up 13% of the US female population represent 30% of incarcerated women. Most have suffered physical or sexual abuse at the hands of the state and most are mothers of minor children. Blacks are six times more likely to be incarcerated than whites. One in four black men is or has been incarcerated. We're going to start this conversation by using the practices of restorative justice as a system to facilitate this conversation. We will be using a circle and we'll go in a particular order. April, the first question is for you. Do these statistics surprise you? And if so, why or why not? Well, first, uh, good evening, Bobcats. How are you doing? I'm so glad that you did decide to join us today. Uh, I speak from a few different perspectives. My name is April Barnes and I'm the Director of Student Success Initiatives here at Texas State and University College. However, I also identify as a Black woman, as a mother to Black sons, as a friend, as a sister, as a wife, 
as an educator and as a peer. But most importantly, I also identify as a Bobcat. Uh, I went to school here for my undergraduate and my graduate work. In addition to that, I worked here for almost 16 years. So I have seen this campus go through a lot of different changes, uh, some great, some that could use a little bit of improvement, which is why we are here today. But I have seen both sides of the equation. I know once as a student, I was pulled over uh, for riding in the left-hand lane. This was not a rule I was even aware of. Uh, the left-hand lane is only for passing, but I'm from a very small East Texas town where there are no highways and there is no such thing as these types of rules. I was pulled over, I was uh, searched, my car was searched, I was questioned at length to where I was even asked to spell my middle name as if my driver's license was fake. Uh, all of that just to be let off with a warning at the end of it. And as a mother now, my oldest son just got his driver's license. And this should be a time that we are very excited about. You know, it's a rite of passage for him. However, it scares me to death. And I'm being very honest. Even when he just drives to the mailbox, it's a real thing. Even though we have prepped him, we have talked to him at length, and he's a good kid. Like he is, I'm not just saying that because he's mine, but he is an amazing kid. And I still know that I cannot shield him from such things. And then if you add to that, my youngest son is on the spectrum. He has autism. He's only 12, but because his brother has his driver's license, of course he wants one too. And that's not something that I can even think about at this time, because I know that no matter how much we train him, when he is put in a situation where he is nervous or, um, or he feels threatened, he is not going to comply. He is not necessarily going to follow directions. He is not going to let you touch him. He is going to be resistant. And I know that my cute little 12 year old will then be looked at as a threat. So, no, these statistics do not surprise me at all. Thank you. Cree, you're next. Hi, I'm Cree Taylor. I'm a senior criminal justice major and member of NAACP and Texas State Interruptions. Um, these statistics do not surprise me because I feel often in our country, people of color and specifically black people are seen as threats rather than contributors to the country that we live in. So it doesn't surprise me that people outside of us, outside of ourselves, outside of um, the people of color community would want to essentially like get us off the streets. And so I feel like that's why it's so easy when you see a white kid walking down the street, your police often feel um, threatened or he's a kid or he's a child, but I can't say the same for like my black family members and my father and my cousins and things like that because when they're seen it's he must be up to no good he must he looks suspicious we should probably go talk to him because there's already this stereotype embedded in their heads that we're automatically a threat we're automatically causing issues when we could be doing nothing at all so yeah thank you that's all for now <laughs> thank you q you're next in line Hi, everybody. My name is Quadarius McCarran. and I go by Q. Um, I'm a graduate student in the Student Affairs and Higher Education program. And I also work as a graduate assistant at Fraternity Sword Life within the Dean of Students. Um, and also, again, no, these statistics do not surprise me. And I think a piece of that is because I don't necessarily have the privilege to have these statistics surprise me. A lot of the things that Dr. Goldstone talked about in those statistics are things that my mom talked about whenever I was growing up, things that I need to be aware of um, and things that in my community you have to be aware of. And I don't really have the privilege to, to be, oh, I'm shocked by that because that's just the life that I live in. Um, so I've been pushed and forced to do research to learn more about ways that I can be supportive and ways that I can fight back against these stigmas and stereotypes that come from these statistics. I think he's frozen. 
I'm going to move to Dr. Guajardo. Thank you, Dr. Goldstone. Uh, my name is Miguel Guajardo. I, uh, I came to Texas State in 2004. I, I came here because I got really excited about its declaration and its commitment to becoming an HSI. I also came here with the knowledge that Texas State, formerly Southwest Texas, had always been, since its inception, a white stream institution. It's had a troubling history of issues of race and equality. But I came here eager in, in its public transformation or commitment to transform. I, uh, I've witnessed its changes. I've witnessed the diversity growth. But as an academic and as a scholar who studies the politics of education, I also knew that the numbers we would reach just basic, you know, it's basic demographics. The growth in Texas was sh shifting, public schools was shifting. So we're gonna get to that. And, and we did, and we got to that number a lot faster than what anybody anticipated, I think. The, the second part of that transformation is, you know, as I understand diversity on campuses, is how have we changed as it relates to curriculum, faculty who can support not just the curriculum, but students, and then climate. And I think these cultural and political elements and pedagogical elements have been much slower to change. And, uh, and I've reached a certain level of frustration at times. And, uh, and, and these numbers that you share with us and the conditions of our society, you know, I understand, and to a large extent, this is a reason of the resistance to change. And, and so as, as you read these numbers and, uh, and conditions of the country, you know, part of what I know based on my research is that schools mirror communities. And all of these numbers come onto our campus. In fact, we bring them to our campus. And we bring a certain level of blind spots. We bring a certain level of, of privilege. And, uh, and we bring a certain level of trauma and I think about this and I think about these numbers, they weren't created yesterday. In fact, we bring them with us. In a recent publication by Doug Swenson, he wrote a book entitled The Cult of Glory, The Bold and Brutal History of the Texas Rangers. Mm -hmm. And so Mexicans in, 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 in the South and along the border have really lived a history of trauma. And I carry this trauma with me because growing up knowing that a mother gave birth to three kids in Mexico, but a mother who was a, a U.S. citizen. And, and as we, I grew up and my brothers grew up, then we begin to learn the history that, you know, my, my grandparents owned property just on the, on the border of the Rio Grande, the Rio Bravo as we refer to it, but the, the Texas Rangers, you know, gunpoint democracy or justice pushed my grandfather and their family south. And so it, it's a trauma that was rarely spoken of, but it was one that I think all of us attempted to reconcile as we developed our identity. So I'm here as a witness, I'm here to acknowledge Black Lives Matter, Black minds matter, and the soul of Black people matter. And I'm also here as an advocate and support for brown bodies and poor people everywhere. And so I'm a teacher by trade, and I do that proudly. And I think, you know, in spite of all the challenges that our institution faces, I remain hopeful. And thank you for having us. Thank you very much for that. Evan? Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Evan Bookman. I am the Senior Advisor for Black Men United and the Political Action Chair for Texas State University um, NAACP. Um, to put it blunt bluntly, um, unfortunately, uh, these statistics do not surprise me. Um, the police in our criminal justice system, as I see it, has always been inherently against Black and Brown people. Um, I, you know, 
I don't see how you know, this current system of policing is effective or efficient. I don't, the system as it exists right now, I don't believe it ever will be. And I think any improvement or betterment of that system will only continue to harm black and brown communities. Thank you. Dizzy? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Dizzy Harrison. I am a sophomore. I'm a grant clerk with Upward Bound. It's a program that helps uh, students get ready for uh, college. And I also have the privilege of serving on the executive board for the Hip Hop Congress. I'm the events and programming chair. Um, just as the rest of my peers said, these, these statistics are uh, no surprise at all. Um, I identify as a biracial woman. My mother's white and my father's black. And although I have light privilege and um, I may not, well, not may not, I will not experience uh, the things that my sister will or my father will. Um, the ramifications of racism and um, these statistics are prevalent in my family. Um, the fact of the matter is the prison system was built to keep uh, black individuals down uh, and the police perpetuate that. Um, but if it's okay with the rest of the panel, I would like to give the rest of my time on this to Q, just because as a black mm -hmm. man, I feel like he has a better perspective. Thank you. Q, do you want to finish what you were saying? You kind of froze. Oh, can you tell me where I went out? Because I'm not sure. I don't remember. Does anyone okay, else remember? Well, just say, I, say. To speak quickly. Okay. I appreciate that, Dizzy, as well. Um, speaking on that, I feel like I don't have the privilege to uh, not know these statistics. Like whenever I was growing up, my parents, my mom was instilling in me these things to be in order for me to be safe uh, from a young age. So I don't have the privilege to walk around and be surprised by the fact that one in four black men has been incarcerated in their life or one of four black men has, or has. So like, I have to, I have to know that. Um, and that's really what I was trying to say in my time is that some people have the privilege to ignore this fact or to just be oblivious until now, whenever I would argue that Black Lives Matter has become pretty trendy to companies and to people to discuss. So I didn't have that luxury and I still don't have that luxury. So I have to continue and continue to learn so that I know how to advocate for people like me. Thank you. Chris? Hello. My name is Kofi, and I am a graduate student now. Um, and I'm the president of Queer Cats. Um, it's nice to see all of y'all here. Um, and the statistics aren't surprising to me. Um, like many of my peers, you know, growing up Black is traumatic and you know we're in an age where we've had so much growth i guess and we strive so hard our, our ancestors and people before us have strived so hard to get us to this point um and then you look around and you wonder how much work still needs to get done um, because when you look at the 13th Amendment, I believe, you know, you see in that amendment where, you know, slavery was outlawed, but if you, if you are, you know, a prisoner in the U.S. jail system, you are, you're a prisoner, but you're also a slave. Um, and so that's that workaround. And soon after that, all the laws that went into play to incarcerate Black men to lock these people up and so their communities, you know, are without fathers, without these people who for a long time were the head of the family. Um, and for me personally, my mother has four brothers and each one of them have been in prison and they have all been incarcerated um, for lengthy amounts of times. And, you know, as a black person, you ask yourself, were their sentences fair? Were those sentences a little bit too long for the crime that they did, you know? Uh, so these, these statistics aren't surprising because I've seen them. I lived through them. You know, I came up in a predominantly black neighborhood. 
And these things were non-existent to me because, you know, I didn't see them because there was no racism in my immediate surrounding. And I remember coming to Texas State and a lot of my friends went to um, predominantly black colleges. And they always said like, you know, you're making the wrong choice or, you know, you're going to see a lot of things that might scar you, might traumatize you. And I did, I did. I'm in my first um, semester here at Texas State, almost four years ago now. My friends and I were racially profiled on campus by UPD. Um, we were just walking and there was someone screamed and you know, it got really traumatic really quickly because at that time we were feared for our lives. You know, being black kids who've never been surrounded by white cops. The cops in our community were all black. And, you know, we hear so much media about the white cop and then we're there, we're, we're shocked, we're shook. We're, you know, we have no words for this. We were, the only thing we feared, it was our lives. We feared for our lives. Um, and I know like someone said, it's, we bring to the Texas State community what we have in our communities. And I think it, it's, we need to educate students, you know, even before getting here, like what they're getting into. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Zachary is next. Guys, uh, my name is Zachary. Uh, I'm a senior here at Texas State. Um, also, the student representative on the LGBTQIA coalition that is um, on campus. Um, I always say that growing up Black is to just be born as an adult. Um, we don't get to be innocent. We don't get to enjoy our childhoods. We're always having to have these adult conversations um, about things that we really shouldn't be concerned at at our ages. And it's really sad that it's our reality, but it is our reality. Um, just a few weeks ago, my little cousin was outside playing with a toy gun. And we all got so scared and we had to go snatch the gun back and just explain like, it's probably not a good idea for you to be outside, you know, waving this gun around, somebody see it, get the wrong idea, call law enforcement, and then it's a different situation. Or, you know, even walking around late at night in your neighborhood, even if your parents pay a mortgage in their neighborhood, it's not something that's acceptable for you to do um, because someone could think that you are up to no good and you have different intentions than what you do. And just kind of going off what Chris said and, and the, statistics, the statistics that you shared, uh, Dr. Goldstone, I just think it's very interesting because a lot of times the system is aware that people of color normally do not have the resources to get good lawyers, to get the plea deals and to get their charges um, scrub from their record and things like that. So, you know, the white counterparts are able to walk away scot-free and they have generational wealth that is going to allow them to restart their lives or pick up where they left, left off. And then, whereas we have not been afforded those opportunities historically. And so when we get out of jail and our family members are in the systems and then they can't apply for social service programs and things like that, you're left with very few options and then you, you just become a re repeat offender and the system takes advantage of that. And like Chris was saying, it's, it's just modern day slavery, so. Thank you. Amari? Hi everyone, my name is Amari Shelvin. I'm a senior graduating next week with a degree in Spanish. Oh, you can't hear me or can you? No, I can't, I'm oh. shocked that you're graduating. Oh yeah, surprise. That means we won't be together anymore. Yeah, so going off what Zach said, it made me think about a quote from our former LB, LBJ distinguished lecturer, Brian Stevenson. He said, the opposite of poverty is not wealth, it's justice. So um, with all this being said, it made me think about one of the statistics that you provided. And it said that black people are more likely to be unarmed than white people. It made me think about an experience I had in New York City. I was serving an internship and the people I was showing around the city, they were very scared. We were in a black neighborhood. And my boss, he told me, they don't know that these black people are not likely to touch them. Like, because black people know in their minds, they know that 
the consequences of harming a white person versus harming anyone else or a black person are much greater than if they didn't. So um, we see that, so for example, we know that carrying guns is, it's, it's hard for us. We see that with Philando Castile, he was shot, he was murdered. He told the police officer, hey, I have a gun in my side. He still got murdered in front of his daughter. Um, so from the distrust, distrust of police, we saw things happening such as formation of gangs. Um, and then I saw this tweet other, the other day that said, that Italian mobs are like romanticized, but gangs are look frowned upon. But it just, it was interesting for me to think about how we have these stereotypes in our mind against black people and we automatically assume wrong between them. But yeah. That's Thank it. you. Kiera. Hello, uh, my name is Kiera Haynes. I'm a senior for the social work program at Texas State. I'm a secretary for the Texas State NAACP and a senator on student government. And for the most part, I agree with what everybody has stated here, and I think they all made some valid points. But the one statistic that kind of stuck out to me was the one that um, Dr. Gonzo mentioned about the amount of women of color and how they're like the most rising population in the prison systems. And I think it shocked me because when we talk about racial injustices, police brutality, et cetera, we don't really talk about women as much as we do males. And I think we should keep that in consideration. Like I can't speak for everyone here, but I know the only two solid women that I can remember talking about was Sandra Bland to Breonna Taylor. And keep in mind, Sandra Bland was like, I wanna say five years ago and Breonna Taylor was recently, and that's a five-year gap to where we haven't, I don't know if you guys have heard about it, but me personally, I don't remember hearing about that many women who have been um, victimized in situations like this, and I think that's important to keep in mind, and Black women are constantly left out of the conversation, and it's not fair, so that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Uh, I'm, so I'm going to open it up to another question, and before I go, I want to remind those who are watching that if you have questions you want to ask the panel to please send them in and we'll get to as many as we can toward the end of the program. So the next question I have, and this is for anyone who wants to answer, a few of you have already talked about it, but has, does anyone want to talk about a time that they were racially profiled either on or off campus and talk about how that made you feel? I guess you can raise your hand. Go, Cree. Cree. Um, when um, this was actually when I was younger, I was about 16, and I was on a way to a school event my boyfriend was taking me to. He's, he's visibly white, but he is black. And um, we were pulled over, and the cop, I don't even know how to describe it, it was kind of a blur. Um, we were pulled over, and as soon as the cop like came to our car, he asked my boyfriend to get out, and he swung the door open and he had the light in my face and he was screaming at me and cussing at me and asking me questions did i have anything in the car was anything going on like what were you guys doing where are you taking her where are you going like basically all the questions in terms of like what was happening and what i was doing was being directed to me when i wasn't even in the driver i didn't even have a license at the time he was just taking me to my program and the crazy thing is at the end of it um he d actually didn't even end up giving us any type of citation warning ticket he just told us to get the f out of here and we left and i remember going home and i was so confused because i was like i wasn't even the one driving if there was anyone he should be talking to it should have been my boyfriend but it that wasn't really the case at all and the entire thing kind of scared me and although my entire life I think I've kind of had a distrust with police I feel like it made it very clear that even myself I'm pretty like soft like spoken and I'm pretty calm oh <laughs> I'm pretty calm for the most part that 
even with that being said, it didn't matter. I was still seen as like a villain in that sense. So yeah, that's it for that. Thank you. Anyone else? Kiara? Um, so my experience kind of goes back. I think Chris was the one who stated it growing up in a predominantly black community. And even like my father is a police officer. So growing up on say the South side of Houston, that was where he worked. I was like comfortable with the police because they felt safe with him because he grew up in that community. And so he knew everybody who lived there. So being in my own bubble, I really like, I didn't, I guess I was oblivious to police brutality because it's like, I see my dad doing good in the community. I don't, like I was young, I didn't really expect anything. And this past, not this past summer, but 2019, I did a study abroad trip and I went to uh, England, Scotland, Ireland, and I was the only black person in that whole group. And there was like 20 of us. And so I remember I went to a Kate Spade store in Scotland and I was the only black person there and I had a cop and one of the people who worked at the store followed me around the whole store and they weren't worried about the white people who I walked in the store with and I was really confused and I was like I'm just looking at stuff and they're like no don't touch this um if you're are you paying for this you can't pick this up and I was like and none of like my white friends were like defending me they were just doing their own thing and I was like Okay, so I guess I was one of the ones who like I didn't understand it until it happened to me and it kind of felt like discouraging and like kind of like I don't know word for it but it was just saddening that as a black woman at 20 that was my first time experiencing that and it took that experience that small experience thankfully nothing else happened for me to actually want to join the conversation and be like yeah this can't happen because this is unacceptable. Thank you. Chris? Hello. Um, so I want to like talk about what Kiara is saying and the way that I know a lot of the time people think about racial profiling and they just think about the police. Um, but I want to say that that's, that it doesn't end there. You know, being Black, you're profiled by everyone who is not black and even at times other black people you know so you grow up knowing that all eyes are on you and not for like a good reason it's for because they expect the worst from you um and i know just another story from my college days is i know there was an, a time where me and my friends were going to a party um and it was a frat party. I don't remember the letters, but it was a white frat. Um, and like I said, we come from predominantly black neighborhood, you know? So it was me, my four friends, and then our two friends who are white. Um, they also raised around, like we were raised around, we had no idea what we were getting into. And this is the, this is the, this is the part where Kiara is like the bubble. Like that bubble, it's so dangerous because you don't know what's outside of it until you actually get into it. So, you know, we're going in and we had already kind of, it clicked for us, the misogyny and the, the system of fraternity um, and brotherhood that, you know, girls always, like if there's a girl, like for every like two girls, a guy comes in. So we had worked that math out. Like it was like, basic freshman math, you know. Um, and we were expecting that to get us in, but then we were stopped at the door and they looked at us and they said, you two, like they, they were right around us, our two white friends, you all can come in, but we don't have enough space for y'all. And they walked in. <laughs> and we were like, okay, why, why, why can't we come in? And then like, oh, uh, okay. That's why we can't come in. Like it hit us, like all the stories, all the things our friends had warned us about going to a predominantly white institution, they start like rushing in. Okay, so this is it. It's like, this is, you know, this is racism. 
this is the profiling that and i remember this is the hardest part about it because like you know we left like we could we understood we weren't wanted there but it was our white friends who after like they saw that we were there, they came out like why didn't y'all come in And it's explaining that to someone who doesn't experience blackness that we're here again for, to explain the, the trauma that, you know, a lot of us just started having, like a lot of us didn't know what's trauma until it came up. And it's just, it, it starts so early and it starts so harshly for some people. And for some people that first experience is, you know, a dangerous and deadly experience. So like that's, that's how, dangerous profiling is and that's why it's so important to educate people to educate your family to educate your friends about what black people are going through every single day so thank you thank you does anyone want to speak so this question is kind of playing off um and this came from someone who's watching at what age did you all realize that you were black and hispanic and or hispanic and kind of what did your, did your parents tell you? What's the story about that, April? I'm, I'm actually, I'm just gonna go around and you're first anyway. So I'll just, we'll go back through the circles. Okay, that's fine. I like to be first, it's okay. Well, well you're um, first anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the first time I realized, and this is probably something that a lot of little black girls will sympathize with and understand, was I wanted to wear my hair down. Mm -hmm. And that may not seem like a really big issue, but I wanted my hair like my friend Heather's hair, who had long flowy bangs and like, you know, the fair faucet-ish kind of curls. And yes, I just totally probably dated myself. <laughs> but um, that's what I wanted. And as you can see, this don't really do that, right? It doesn't do that. And so I didn't understand why I had to wear, you know, the ponytails with the bubbles and the beads and all of that, because I couldn't wear my hair down. And that was the first time I realized, I think, when I was, that I was different. And that was probably like the first grade. Mm. Um, it happens really early. I mean, I knew I was Black. I knew my family was Black but I did not realize that that was something that would now classify you as an other. Mm -hmm. That it was necessarily a bad thing. Because when you're around family and friends, everybody looks like you, everybody acts like you, everybody wears their hair like you. But when you get out of it, uh, I think that was definitely the first time. And, um, and so that, that was hurtful because I didn't understand uh, something that, again, does not seem like a big thing. But to this day, you know, for every black woman, they can tell you that hair is a source of contention sometimes forever and ever. And how you wear it and what you do with it and what you don't do with it and what the expectation is that you do with it, um, it is a whole nother ball game. So I would say that's the first time that I realized I was black or other or different. Okay, thank you. Cree? Um, for me, I think it was more, um, I grew up dancing and in a lot of sports. So once I hit puberty, I started to notice that um, physically I was just very different. Um, and even in the dance world, uh, black dancers are for the most part consistent, consistently more athletically built rather than like the like petite frame you would people thought was like the model dancer kind of look. And so it got kind of weird for me because um, I used to get a lot of, and I didn't realize it was wrong at the time, but I used to get a lot of comments on like my hips and like my butt and like my legs. And it just, it made me feel, I constantly felt like separated from like all of my, most of my, well, pretty much all of the other dancers um, were white that had like, these long legs and like um, long kind of, and nothing's wrong with it, but like longer, lankier bodies. And I just always had more of like an athletic build. And, and when it came to dance, um, we have different hairstyles and I had to work it out differently than my friends did. And so it made me kind of realize that like, even in the dance world, 
that everything has always been kind of accommodated to white dancers or like European dancers and where I had to make my own changes in order for it to work for me because the like the performance world wasn't made for necessarily people like me and so with that even with that my hair um, obviously all black dancers and black people have different textures and hair types and body types but um, I remember when I would like straighten my hair people I used to get comments that I didn't realize obviously till later that they were bad like oh you have like white people hair now and I was just like well wait I was just like no I just it's mine <laughs> but I just I straightened it for the moment I straightened it for the day I changed it up and it was just I didn't realize until way later on probably not even until I got to college that like all of the little things I had to do differently compared to them the way I was seen differently and yeah it was a lot of it had to do more of like with my physicality I think than necessarily my like mental family cultural experience so yeah thank you dr guajardo yeah i think q was after her oh yeah sorry q, q. Yeah, sorry thank you um i think whenever i think about whenever i first knew i was black i would say that it was somewhere around first or second grade i can't remember but it was when my mom wanted me to start getting involved in some type of activity. So I got involved in Boy Scouts. And that's not something that anybody in my, I grew up in a low income black community. So that's not something that people in my community did. So I stepped into Boy Scouts, it was all white boys. And I still remember it vividly, the othering that I felt from them, even at such a young age. One thing that showed me that racism is taught uh, as we grow up, but also just how much they made me feel different because I was Black. And I think that that was the first real experience where I felt kind of as Ms. April said, around Blackness as othering or Blackness as less than was from these young Black, young white boys who were the same age as me showing me that I was not accepted in their space because I was Black. So I would say it was, it was somewhere in early elementary school that I realized that Blackness was different and Blackness was not as good as what whiteness is. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Guajardo. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Golston, thank you. Um, you know, for, for me, and I, I, I come at a different generation than the rest of uh, my panel members here, I, uh, I knew I was different and I was not white the first day I stepped on school. I come, from, I come from, you know, a household that was just, you know, loving, supportive, very, very economically poor, grew up in, in shacks, housing projects, but never missed a meal and never lacked love. And so go, go to first grade in public schools and immediately I see the misalignment because I don't speak English. And so I don't know the rules of the game. And, and there was always this tension because I'd go home and I was reminded of all the, the riches and, and the beauty of life. But then I'd go back to school and every grade was the same. And I was reminded of the deficits that I brought with me. And so there was always this tension and, you know, things got a little bit better, but it only got better because you learned how to play the game. And so I figured out that I could be an athlete and I could perform and then I could be accepted. But even that, my parents didn't appreciate because it was a different type of currency and a currency that they didn't teach me at home, but in order to understand how to survive, I had to learn the rules of engagement, even if they violated the values that I had at home. So then moving quick forward, in the early 80s, I walked onto the University of Texas campus. 48,000 students. There's only like 2,500 Chicanos on campus. 
you know, and it was like, whoa, how do you survive in this environment? But really, it was easy because I went back, not to what school taught me, but to what my parents and my family and my community taught me. And so I found and we learned how to build our own communities. And so, again, I was reminded that maybe I was worthy or maybe I was just a product of affirmative action. And I accepted it because that was the policy of the day. And there was a progressive attempt to make the wrongs right. And then, and then I matriculate, right? I do community work and then I go and get my, my first faculty gig, best job I've ever had. But again, my values and my work had a misalignment. And I'm gonna make a leap here, right? Because the conversation of the day is about policing. And I don't wanna miss this other force that we call policy. That is a such a much greater, much more benign force that all of us on this panel are products of public policy. And if we lose that, because we've, we're distracted with the policing, then I think we're only having half of the battle. And so I, I leave that place because of the misalignment, I come to Texas State. And I said, all right, there's a commitment here, a commitment to, for people of color, a commitment to be responsive to Latino communities. And I walk into my first class. I don't know the environment, right? So I show up early. I sit in class. I sit in one of the, the the uh, desks and as people walked in, I stand up and I said, let's rearrange the room because we're gonna sit in circle. This is the way I roll, this is the way I teach, right? And it, the students look at me and say, no, this is fine, this is the way we like it. And it took me about a second and I said, okay, so did they not understand? And then I caught it and I said, oh my God, they don't think that I'm the faculty member. So that's not racial profiling, but it is one of those microaggressions that it takes, it took me a little while, right? So, so I think the, these, these are some of the underlying stories that aren't told because I'm a faculty member, right? And I know the rules of the game. And so I could have either just pulled a power game which I'm pretty good at, but that was a teachable moment, right? So as faculty members, how do we teach? Because as Fereira reminds us, in order for the oppressed to be liberated, we gotta liberate the oppressor. And that's a hell of a mandate, but it is one that we can't turn our backs on, right? And this is why I come and I participate here because somebody's gotta do the heavy lifting. And, uh, and I appreciate all of you here. Thank you. Evan? Um, for me, you know, I've always been aware of my blacklist, blackness. You know, my parents have always taught me to be proud of myself, but also know that, you know, you are a, uh, you know, a black young man and the world does perceive you differently. But in terms of just like feeling other, like just in terms of not just knowing that there was something different about me, I want to say, you know, when I was about five or six years old, you know, me and my mom, you know, we went to go get a snow cone on a weekend, right? And she had, um, you know, we were up next to line to like order our snow cone and she had gave me the money to pay for it. And, you know, I'm like, I don't know, four feet tall or something. You know, I, I kind of get on my tippy toes to put the money on the counter. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready for my snow cone. And then, um, you know, the people um, who worked there, like all of them were white, you know, it was owned by um, a white family. And the owner is like, um, you know, he hands us our snow cones, but he's like, where's the money? And I'm like kind of confused right now. And my mom's like, uh, my son just gave it to you. And, you know, now he's, you know, he's getting combative now because he's like, nobody ever gave me any money. And uh, at this at this point, you know, my like my mom and him, they're going back and forth. And, you know, my mom started to get really emotional because he's like, my son just paid, just paid you. Like, I, I saw it. And then, like, um, at this point, he's telling us, 
um, you know, give us a snow cone back. Y'all got to leave. You know, if, if you can't pay, you know, you can't have it or whatnot. And, you know, there was also um, a black off-duty police officer behind us. And, you know, I would think he would have saw me, you know, give the the owner the money. But, like, he was just kind of saying, like, you know, um, he was talking to my mom. He was like, ma'am, you know, I'm an off-duty police officer. Um, if the man said you didn't pay, you didn't pay, you got to you gotta either pay or you got to leave. And, you know, that was just, you know, like, you know, I'm like five, six years old. So I'm like trying to like process what just happened. And I'm just like really confused. But I mean, you know, like I never hear that type of situation happening with like, you know, white people or anything like that. So I guess that was one of the first situations where I felt like that I like kind of just felt other than human being or just like realized that, you know, me being black is I'll be treated different in this world. Thank you. Dizzy? So I learned a little later, I learned about um, right before I entered high school and it was from my own family. So up until my freshman year of high school, I was raised with my mom, just my mom. Um, she was really estranged from my grandparents and I didn't learn why <laughs> until I went to live with them. Um, but we were, I was raised inner city. I was, I'm from the uh, Southwest 80, or SWAT. You know, that's my home. Uh, <laughs> uh, low income, you know, and it's, the majority is, is, is black individuals. I was raised, I was raised as a, um, as I, I was raised to believe that I was just black. Like, obviously I know my mom's white and I can tell that I'm white skin, but it, it really wasn't a question of, I was accepted. And black community is one of the most accepting communities out there. The most accepting community. Um, but I, I move away from my mom and I moved to move in with my grandparents. And um, that's like when the signs start to, um, like started to hit me that I'm not black, I'm biracial. And um, it's, it, was, it was from my grandparents because I, I was maybe two or three shades darker than I am now because I was a kid, you know, I was always out in the sun, outside or whatever. I was the darkest that my grandparents could handle. That's how I learned um, that I was black. Um, they were like the nicknames, you know, and she would all, she painted my hair in braids today or curly. It had to be flat ironed and um, or permed. <laughs> um, and I had to dress a certain way and talk a certain way. And this went, I didn't even notice it. This went until about the middle of my senior year before I moved back to live with my mom. Um, but yeah, I realized that me being as pale as I am is the, it was too dark for, for my family. And that's, yeah, that's how I knew. <laughs> Thank you. Chris? Uh, um, so both of my things, kind of like Evan, they stem from money. And I know the first time I was about I have three older sisters and the youngest girl, she's four years older than me. So she was about nine. So I was five. Um, and when you talk about memories, you talk about, it's, it's, you know, the trauma is what really makes you remember. Um, and I remember she had had a friend who was one of the only few people who were still in my neighborhood after the white flight took place. Um, if you don't know what white flight is, it's pretty much the phenomena of black and brown bodies entering neighborhoods that are predominantly white. And then those white bodies have the privilege and the money to be able to relocate because they are uncomfortable by this new transition of color into their neighborhoods. Um, and so it was the fact that, you know, my sister had this friend and she spent the night at our house um, and a few days later, you know, she was treated so nicely. I was there. I ate dinner with her. It was so nice. She was friendly. 
Um, and then a few days later, I know my sister was really upset about something. Um, so, you know, the little girl had, she was little at the time, she told her friends that, you know, because they all wanted to be her friend. They all wanted to be my sister's friend because they heard like how well this girl was treated at our house. And, you know, my sister was very, very friendly, very open. And I remember after this, she kind of closed off. And so the friend had told all the people there that, you know, you don't want to go to her house. She's poor. Like, she doesn't have anything. Like, you know, we didn't, there was nothing to eat. There was, we didn't have anything. And at the time, we didn't, I definitely didn't get it. But my sister was, I remember the conversation that we had with my parents and it was like you know contrary to what she had told all those all the people back at my sister's school she was actually the one who was poor she was low income and we were taking her in giving her food you know she had never seen black people who had things who had you know wealth you know and it was the conversation with my parents and they were like you know we're not supposed to have the things that we have. You know, we had to work so hard to get out of those places that we were, that, you know, those people say that we should belong, like we should be in the ghettos, we should be in the projects. And you, my parents are telling me that being black, you know, that's where you stay, you know, and it's really hard to get out of that. And we had to try our best to do it. And we did, and the white people don't recognize that, you know, they don't, they don't see the hard work. Um, and so that was when I was five, and I forgot who spoke of it. I don't know if it was Zach, um, about like the Boy Scouts. But it's the same thing, really. I know I, I was really shy as a kid, and you know, Boy Scouts were predominantly white, and I was one of the only black kids there. Um, and you know, I didn't really like to go on trips because I didn't want to be around other people. I just wanted to stay home. I was a homebody, still am. Um, but, you know, it was very much the fact that they took me not going on trips as me not having the money to go on trips or me not wanting to pay the camping fees. In reality, I didn't tell my parents we were going camping because I didn't want to go with those people, you know, because I felt that difference. I felt the other. I was like, I don't want to be with those people. So I never tell my parents we were going on camping trips. I remember the, the headmaster, he was like, hey, like, you know, I've seen that you haven't been going on the trips. We all pitched in a fund to pay for your, you know, your trip. So your family can have a chance for you to go. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm young. Yeah, I'm like, okay, like, you know, this man's paying for my trip. And then um, I remember he came to drop the check off at my house. And I remember seeing him in the, the, front, the front lawn and he was just looking around and my dad came out of the, the, our house and he's like, who are you? You know, like, why are you here? And he's like, well, I was coming to drop this check off for your son's trip, but it doesn't look like he needs it. And my dad is a very, ooh, um, very you know over the top guy so he's like what the hell why do i need why, why would you think i needed this you know and he the man he he felt you know he turned red you know he turned all red and he was like yo i just assumed he's like you assumed wrong we don't need your help and i remember my dad he's a very petty very petty man okay, I'm, gonna have to, I'm gonna have to stop you because we're, we're running short on time <laughs> you're, you're okay petty. all right thanks all right, so for the, I'm, I'm gonna try to get some more people in. So I'm gonna switch the question up a little bit. And this question came from someone who is watching. And the question is, is what can we who are white faculty do as we teach to make black students feel more welcome? And so I'm gonna do Kiara. So Zachary, I think you're next. And then Amari and then Kiara. And try to keep it short. Kiara, or Zachary's first, sorry. Um, I think, the thing that I would say is um, just making sure that you guys are accessible um, to us. I think, um, especially in my earlier years here at Texas State, um, some of my professors, and I've only had maybe three black professors during my whole time here. And my other professors have kind of made it seem like it's an honor just to be in their presence. And 
I'm not afforded resources that I need outside of instruction in the classroom. And then you see a lot of people fail out of these classes. You see a lot of these professors get rep reputations for being um, difficult and combative and just not creating conducive learning environments. So I would just say that accessibility is, is what I needed. So I'm going to ask you to exp explain what you mean by accessibility. What, what does that look like to you? Just, um, I've gone to professors for things ranging from disputes about grades or just needing more understanding on the lesson that was um, provided. And I've gotten like pages from professors that were just so condescending and uh, so dismissive and just really make you shut down and feel less than um, because they write it in a, a sense of why is everyone else able to to grasp this and they're all on this page and you're still here and it's it's like I'm paying for a service here mm -hmm. so just making sure that I get the most out of this um, I think will be a really helpful thing okay thank you is Amar I think Amari is next yes so we're dealing with a system that it's harder for Black people to pull themselves up out of poverty, out of uh, systemic like racism. So I would just say, try to, if you notice students failing or you know struggling in a subject, you can, if you really want to change things, maybe reach out to them if you know they're a person of color or a Black person and say, hey, I really want to see you succeed. Can you come to my office hours? And then that try that kind of helps with the gap. Like a lot of Black people may not have letters of recommendation for grad school. So ultimately that could help close the gap. So I would just say try to be a mentor and help give them a little push, you know, be there. Do you want them to yell at you like I yelled at you? Yes, that actually works. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Kiara. Um, I guess all I can say is that white faculty members can just try to do their research to know how to connect with their students that are that label or identify as people of color, black people, Latinx, because a lot of the times there's a disconnect and you like it's that I think it's that cultural disconnect that you don't have with white professors. Like my first black professor was Dr. Johnson, Ronald Johnson, and he immediately let me know that like he was a safe space and I can relate to him and connect with him in any way I needed to. And I think that was something that I really couldn't get from white professors. And I don't know if they don't know how to do that because I can only tell you how much based off of my experience, I can't speak for like all 20 of us on this um, panel right now. But yeah, so I think they just have to educate themselves and just see, like reach out to the community and just see not just one person, but like mm -hmm. dibble and dabble. So this is um, a short, I just want a short answer. Don't go on. So the question is, is what is one thing that you think Texas State could do to make the experiences of people, of the students of color better? Do you want to, does everyone want to go? You want to raise your hand? Go Cree. And then Dizzy. Um, if I'm going to be brutally honest, I used to go to UT before I transferred to Texas State and I kind of had the same experience where I felt, I felt like I wasn't seen as a black student unless I was a black athlete. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it's just a matter of giving us that same type of like checking I feel like the same way that they check in on their white students like I've noticed that a lot of white students with their white professors they have like this bond and they can talk very casually but me myself because like they said I don't have that same cultural um, like connection I get very intimidated and uncomfortable and kind of almost fearful of authority so it's hard for me to go and reach out and it feels like they have no interest in reaching out to us as well so I think it's just a matter of checking yourself as a professor, as admin and checking um, privilege and saying, am I treating these group of people the same way I would treat the people that looked like me? So, yes. Thank you. Dizzy? Okay, so I have a couple reasons. I mean, a we'll couple things. Fast. <laughs> okay, really quick. First one, hire more black um, faculty and staff that is not only in the position of diversity. 
across the board. Hire more faculty and staff. The second one, uh, abolish UPD and replace it with the safety committee of trained uh, de-escalation uh, professionals. Okay, UPD has never done any good for any black students on this campus. Uh, years passed before I got here can explain that. Um, more mental health professionals, this goes back to the, the faculty and staff, black, for black students, there should be a black counselor for every black student. A black student shouldn't have to feel like they have to go to a white counselor, just because to be frank, they're not going to understand their perceptions or what they're going through. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay, thank more, you. But also, yeah. Does anyone, Chris, be fast, you liked it, you're long-winded. I'll, um, you know, acknowledge your biases. Um, even though you feel like you're in a role of, you know, you're, you're above, you know, sometimes you feel like you're above biases, you're not. You know, acknowledge the biases that you have and understand why you're looking at a certain student a certain way or why you're not giving the same help to, that, to a different student that you would to another. That's it. Thank you. Hugh, did you want to go? I think Amari's hand was up before mine. Oh, okay, Amari. Well, she already went, though. Go ahead, Amari. Hurry question. Okay. <laughs> All I want to say is stop requiring or stop making students feel the need to bully you into caring. Like, you know, every time something happens, we're like, hey, what about the uh, international students? And we have to create petitions and all that just to get our university to care. So that. Thank you. All right, Q. And then Dr. Guajardo, you're next. I would say something Texas State that would be good is kind of jumping off of what Chris said is having mandatory racial justice training for all faculty and staff because mm -hmm. A lot of times faculty and staff need to dig deep into those biases that we've been taught throughout our whole lives. And a lot of faculty are bringing that into the classroom, into their syllabi, into their grading, and racial justice training that's intentional would be really good in stopping that from happening to Black students and students of color. Dr. Guajardo? Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna push myself and all of us on the panel and everybody listening here, that I, I, I think that the, the old models and the old answers is what has gotten us here. I don't think that's gonna help for where we wanna go and where we wanna go. I think we are in unprecedented times and I think we need to respond boldly and I think we need to respond with an imagination that you know doesn't necessarily give us the answer, but it shows us where we need to go. I think, you know, last time Dr. Bowman talked, you know, very appropriately about the social contract. I think the social contract has become at times a contract on the social, and especially on the people of color and poor people in this country. I think we need to reimagine, you know, how we conceive a social covenant where we stop doing these transactions and people stop asking, how can I be nice to you and how can I be helpful? but we get to a point where we are human beings and you deserve exactly the same thing that my child deserves. You deserve to be here just like anybody else and stop having me have to explain and justify why I'm here. And so this I think is gonna force us to think about you know, what the possibilities have been I don't think we do diversity very well at all. I don't think we do change well at all. I've been sitting for the last 12 to 15 years in front row during graduations. The panel up on the stage doesn't change. So we don't transition in and out very well. Students do, but we get the same type of dogma that we have within the institution. So I think this is, you know, students, we need that voice, we need the passion because the people closest to the reality are the ones that can best give us the guidance. But I think it requires those of us that are, are in positions of power to be willing to give up part of our own privilege to make the world and the community we live in a better place. And, and, I, and I think, you know, and I applaud all of you on this panel for being vulnerable. This is courageous. It doesn't have to be. This should be the way that we roll in this institution if we want to get to a different place. I've done the research. 
I know the origins of this place, as I know the origins of every public school in this community. We started, and Candy tells us, we were set up from the beginning to be a racist society. And I think we need to imagine and be bold all the way from students to leadership and leadership down. And we stop thinking about the down and up, but we start thinking about the horizontal. And, and I think that's gonna require a lot of imagination and a lot more than we can do on a town hall panel. Because yeah. I think the best responses and reactions and plans are gonna be when we are in conversation. Okay, but even I, even I who have, have the status of professor am not invited to these conversations. So I think we need to think about how we do this. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question before we get to the kind of wrapping up. We have about 14 more minutes left. Um, and again, please try to keep it as short as possible so I can get as many people in. What do you wish white people knew about your life as a person of color in San Marcos, in Texas, in this country? Great, keep it short. Um, I wish they realized that the world is kind of accommodated to them where we kind of have to tiptoe and see how we can make ourselves change for the world when they already have everything like at their feet. We kind of, we have to work almost double as hard to get even halfway to the things they just automatically receive. Like it's a, it's a completely different experience. It isn't it isn't just something as simple as like, oh, I'm not racist, I'm not, th it's like, no, you have a different privilege than I do. I work completely differently than you have to to get where you are, so yeah. April. I wanna say one thing I would want, uh, want people to know about our lives is that they're our lives. Uh, it is valid, our concerns are real, our feelings are true. Uh, don't project stereotypes or what you think of us onto us. We are individuals. Though we are all black, we are all not the same. Even we are also all not the same as brown people. We are not one group of minority. And I think that can be misconstrued. Um, um, also, don't give compliments that are really not compliments. Uh, and the reason I say that is because- You wanna give an time, example? For example, okay, one that <laughs> gets to me is the strong black woman. Yes, we are strong, but that has so many implications. What we hear is you can do anything to us and it will be fine. Mm -hmm. You can treat us any way and it, it's all right because you can handle it. You're strong, right? That's why you only hear about Sandra Brand and Breonna Taylor because everybody else in between was strong and they handled it and it's fine, but that is detrimental to society as well as to our mental health. And that is all. Thank you. Anyone else want to go? Zachary? Um, I just wanted to be known that we dream just as big as you. We love just as hard as you. Um, our families are just as important to us as they are to you. And I just want it to be understood if you're going to be an ally to us as a community, as a people, it goes so much further than posting black squares on your Instagram one day of the year. You have to listen. You have to put yourself in a position to really understand life from our perspective and in our shoes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chris and then Dizzy. Um, I just want there to be like an understanding that just because it's not your experience doesn't mean someone hasn't experienced it. So be open to listening to people and their experiences because their experience is what defined us. And when you close yourself off to other people's experiences, you close, your off, you close yourself off to people in general. Mm -hmm. Dizzy. So understand the trauma, but also understand the role that you play, whether it's your privilege or your ancestors, and, and understand how deep it goes. Like, educate yourself, please. Understand that it's prevalent and we're not just pulling this out of the air. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so we have about 11 minutes left, and so I'm going to go back through the circle one last time. And your last question is, is what is one thing you want people to take away from this conversation? And remember, we have 11 minutes, so don't get long-winded because I'll cut you off. April, you're first. The one thing I want to, you all to take away from this conversation is that we need more of these conversations, but most importantly, we need action after these conversations. Thank you. Karee? Um, my biggest 
to say is don't um, don't assume whether you're an ally or just a white person in general that you've done enough done enough to help us in terms when it comes to social change because when you think you've done enough you stop completely and there is no finish line like I constantly say to you it's you it's a consistent taking you have to look at yourself every day and think how am I enabling the systems that are disadvantaging these other groups of people. How am I adding to that and how can I make a difference and talk to the people around me? Thank you. Q? I would say, similar to Ms. April, stop making Black people spill their trauma like in these sessions before you get it. Like the panelists that are beside me today virtually is powerful and I appreciate everybody for sharing their experiences but we should not have to continue to pour out our trauma in order for you to understand that there's an issue that you need to take action. So please take that step to learn, educate yourself, but also change has to happen, action has to happen, or none of this really matters. Thank you. Dr. Guajardo? Yeah, I want to invite all the 155 people that are still on this call. And I want to ask you to, for all of us to reflect on these stories and these testimonies and this witnessing and ask yourself, where do you find yourself in these narratives? Ibram Candy gives us a spectrum that we've seen historically on how he narr narrates race and the treatment of race in this country. And he says, we have been segregationists, we have been assimilationists, or we have been anti-racist. And as you reflect, I ask you to think about which one are you and what is your role in helping liberate the conscience and the social DNA of our own institution at Texas State. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just kind of um, emphasizing what everybody else said, I'll just say, if, you know, for the white folk listening right now, um, it's not enough to be a white ally. You need to be anti-racist. You need to, you know, be a right revolutionary. You need to be uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. You need to put your, you know, your body and your reputation on the line for, you know, people who don't look like you, for black and brown people. Thank you. Dizzy? Uh, human rights um, are, are not a, like, it's not a belief. It's not like a, oh, we just have differing opinions. No, it's like, these lives matter. And yeah, no, I don't care about your feelings. We need action. Yeah. Thank you. Chris? Um, just utilize, your, utilize the privilege that you have so we don't have to have so many conversations like this. Utilize your power to be in spaces we can't be in. And, you know, talk the talk that you preach, you know? Be what, you, be what you're talking about on your Instagram post. <laughs> Thank you. Zachary, you're next. Um, you know, the thing that I want to be taken away, these are not new stories. These are not new experiences. And so we have to stop acting as if this is the first time we've been presented with these things. Um, a lot of times we don't have seats at the table. And if you don't have a seat at the table, then you don't get to eat. So I think what I would like to see is if you're on these panels and you're in these cabinets, advocate for there to be more more leadership of color added. It's nothing for a position to be created. Thank you. Amari? Yes, I need people to understand their privilege. If you don't have to worry about racism throughout your life, just um, be mindful of that and realize the underlying racism of the system, how slave patrols went and transformed into the police system and how COVID-19 disproportionately impacts people of color. I need you to realize that. Um, and we need your help because we're tired and we just need help. Thank you. Kiera? Um, I wanted to put an emphasis on the fact that it's really important right now for sometimes to just have white people to stop talking and just listen to our stories and everything that we're sharing and not invalidate our feelings just because you haven't experienced it or you don't know someone who has experienced it. Because if I hear another person say, I'm not racist because X, Y, and Z, I'm just gonna snap because that like, you just outed yourself. Like that doesn't make any sense, so yeah. Thank you. 
So this concludes our program. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us and for listening. And I'm reminded of a student I had in the fall who had an event and I asked if I could be on the panel and she said, no, but you can come and listen. And it's something I've thought about a lot because I think a lot of white people need to just come and just listen, not listen to respond, but just come and listen. We're gonna have one more. The third will be held at the beginning of the fall semester and it will focus on policing and law enforcement. We hope you will join us again as we continue our community discussion on storytelling, healing, and transformation. Thank you again to all the panelists. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for being vulnerable. And I hope to see you all in the fall semester with your mask on and six feet away. Thank you.